example, the Avengers here to go in? I, I'm just going to open the door and say, go. Good morning, good morning, and happy, happy Palm Sunday. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The response is, thanks be to God. So let's try that one more time, and we'll go right into the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Awake to the day of triumph for the coming King. Come with your branches, hosannas, and songs. Fill the air with welcome to the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. 
as it is printed in, in our bulletins. We pray in unison. Loving God, sure of your faithfulness, even in your dying, comforted by your compassion toward people in every age, we beg your mercy for our imperfect gratitude. We have looked to you for paltry favors when you have given everything. We have withheld from your people, our neighbors, and from your creation, our earth, the care and tending they deserve. We have rejected the cornerstone you sent to build a people of righteousness even here today. Forgive our failings, heal what we have broken, nurture what we have neglected, and lead us into your vision so that we may know the peace of wholeness in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we serve a God who loves us, a God who comes into our world to, to save us and to be with us. It is cause for great, great celebration. And so, people of God, the Lord be with you. Let's greet each other on this beautiful Palm Sunday morning.
A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. A reading from the New Testament, a letter of Paul to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Word of the Lord. pleasure at, at all times for a congregation to welcome in new members, and today we have that opportunity. Five people have decided to, to join with us, and I'm going to invite them to come uh, forward and to uh, join me here up front. Kathy D. Gregorio, and please put a face with a name. Cindy Hudson. And Stephen Hudson. Donald Mincer. And Thomas Scott. So listen to these words. What fuels our thanksgiving and confirms us as a community of hope, as well as faith, is the joy of receiving new members into the church. These women and men have confessed their Christian faith, have been baptized, and have been affirmed enthusiastically by the church. I will call them by name and ask them to come to the front of the church, which I have already done as part of this liturgy of, of welcome. And so, friends in Christ, we are received into the church by our baptism and by our free and sincere confession of faith. These persons have discovered this church to be a place of nurture and growth, and a place where they sense the support of others in their desire to be disciples of Jesus. 
Through prayer and study, they have been led by the Holy Spirit to claim in our presence their relationship to the Lord and the, mem and the members of this church. They share with us the desire to serve Jesus using the unique gifts and talents granted them by the Holy Spirit. And so we read from Ephesians in the second chapter. You are no longer strangers or foreigners, but you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's holy family. We are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We who believe are carefully joined together, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him you are welcomed and joined together as part of this dwelling where God lives by his, his spirit. And so to, to all of you, we, we truly thank God for you and that you have decided to make this, this motion and this, this time of, of faith. And so I invite you to respond to these questions as I give them to you. And so do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and promise to follow him as Lord? If so, answer, I do. You have made public confession of your faith and have been baptized. Do you accept the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, as the Word of God and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, in conduct. Do you intend to live among God's faithful people, to hear God's word and to share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? And finally, do you also promise to support the ministries of this church, including the conference and denomination to which we belong. And so, of course, this is not something that they do on, on their own, but something that we all do together. So I'm going to invite you to, to stand and to using the phrasing that is there in the bulletin for you to welcome them as members to this, our church. Today, our celebration of Christ's entry to Jerusalem is made brighter in the recognition of your decision to join and unite with us on the Christian journey. We pledge to you our love and support, our friendship and our prayers, so that together we will continue to grow and flourish in the great love of God. Peace to you on this, your special day. And so I invite us to, with our applause, to welcome them into this, our body. So welcome to you. Cindy, welcome to you. So go now and, and serve the Lord. And you may be seated. And so I'm going to invite all the children to come on up front with me up here just for few moments. Well, what an absolute mess. What a mess out there, huh? All those people, and were you responsible for the mess of all those palms that are out there in the, on the floor? 
Yeah, were you? Were you responsible for all those poems that are on the floor? No, 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 no. You weren't responsible either. Because this was the big story of the day that people laid branches down and that Jesus came down and he was riding on a what? Donkey! He was riding on a kind of a horse, a small horse, but a, but a donkey, a donkey. So I even have... I even have some pictures in the bulletin. Did you see those pictures in the bulletin? No? Did you, did you see those? Well, good for you, good for you. Were they good pictures? You didn't see any? Well, after church, after church, you're going to have to go and look at those pictures because I put those pictures in especially for you. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, do you know, have, have any of you been coloring in your, your calendars and stuff like that that's in a shell? Remember we have those? Well, you're not the only ones. You're not the only ones. In fact, somebody showed me their, um, their spiral, and they had just in the first circle just a tiny little bit of color right there. That's how far we got. So, we have another one. We have another one, and this is just for, just for this week, okay? This is just for Holy Week, and so you can color in, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days of Holy Week. Why aren't they what? Thor why aren't there thor Why are they thorns? I think because do you see on the Bible up there, we have a crown of thorns. And that was before Jesus died, the people, yeah, a, a, some, a, a crown of thorns on his head. So this is kind of just to remind us of, of, all, of, of all of that, okay? So at the what? It was kind of a way of, of um, just kind of bullying him, mocking him, making him feel bad, and causing causing real pain causing real pain it wasn't very nice to do but that's what that's what happened yeah it was me it was me so you should get one of these before you grab a piece of cake because we have cake out there not now not now <laughs> but when you get cake after after uh, Sunday school you can also grab one of these okay so can you help us pick up the offering too? Why don't you guys go and get those, those plates? And I'm going to ask you to do one other thing that when you come back and come up front and you put the uh, offering in the, uh, the vessel there, if you could just sit here because I'm going to be singing up there with them, okay? So if you could just stay here, that would be wonderful. All right, thank you very much. Go ahead. Oh, uh -huh. 
invite us to stand for our response. So thank you, O oh God, for all of these great gifts and for this great day. And we give you thanks for all of these things. And we pray this in your name. Amen. And now you may go. Not to eat the cake yet. Not to eat the cake yet. Sunday school, that's right. And we sing our hymn. I'm going to ask that we would join together in unison in the prayer of illumination, which is printed there in your bulletins. So we pray together. Lord, we humbly ask that in the reading of your word, that you will break open our hearts 
and unstop our dulled senses. May your spirit enter our very souls in this holiest of weeks with the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. So you see the, the printing of the story, the familiar story of, of Palm Sunday. But we read it from the New Testament for Gen Z, the unofficial chat GBT translation for Gen Z. So Jesus and his crew roll up near Jerusalem, specifically Bethphage and Bethany on the outskirts by the Mount of Olives. And he sends two of his homies ahead. Jesus tells them, Yo, go out into the village across from us. And once you get there, you'll see a young donkey tied up, never been ridden before. Untie it and bring it back. And if someone asks why they're taking the donkey, they should say, the Lord needs it. And boom, that person will send it right away. So the two disciples head over and find the donkey tied up at the door where two roads meet, and they set it free. And some bystanders are like, hey, what are you doing untying that donkey? And the disciples are like, Jesus told us to do it, and they let them go without any more questions. They bring the donkey to Jesus, throw their clothes on it, and Jesus hops on. A bunch of people start laying their clothes on the ground and others cut branches from trees and scattered them on the path. And those going ahead and those following behind Jesus start shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're praising the kingdom of their ancestor David saying, Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus rolls into Jerusalem and heads to the temple checks everything out, but since it's getting late, he bounces to Bethany with his 12 buddies. The word of the Lord. And so what I want to say to you to begin is simply good for you. Good for you for, for being here today good for you for making it this far in the Lenten trek. It is not about having all of those circles filled out on your Lenten calendars. It's enough just to live in the awareness of this great spiritual drama which is going on all around us. There was a woman who's done wonderful work in poetry. Her name is Anne Weems, and this is what she says on Lent. Lent is a time to take time, to let the power of your faith story take hold, time to let the events get up and walk around in us, a time to intensify our living into Christ. And so good for you good for you for being here. The poet Mary Oliver reflected on Palm Sunday from the perspective of the donkey. So here's what she says, and you might want to even pull out that picture that I have of, of the donkey there in your bulletins. This was her reflection. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited, not especially brave or filled with understanding. He stood and he waited. How horses turned out into the meadow leap with delight. How doves released from their cages clatter away, splashed with sunlight. But the donkey, tied to a tree as usual, waited. And then he let himself be led away. Then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds. And I wonder if he at all imagined what was to happen. Still, 
He was what he had always been, small, dark, and obedient. I hope finally that he felt brave. I hope finally he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped, as he had to, forward. I think that that's the profound line. He stepped as he had to forward. And it's profound because that's exactly what we must do in going into Holy Week. And so what we did here earlier today is actually a, a revolutionary action. Jesus' ride into city was a revolutionary act of resistance against Roman imperial theology, a theology of force and a theology of domination. Jesus led his disciples to his final crucifixion. He had already experienced minor crucifixions along the way. He suffered under the attacks of leaders and officials. But now he moves further into that space where, where he must stand alone. And he must stand alone on the love of the Father and trust him, him alone. So, since we have already messed up the sanctuary, we are going to now mess up this sermon time. Because this is... This is a participative experience today. It's not going to be just me. It's going to be all of us that are, put, that are put together. The mess is on the floor of the sanctuary. Now we'll mess up the homily. This is a working class homily. And what were going on in Jerusalem that day? What was going on in Jerusalem that day. Why then? Why there? So I have to give credit to John Dominic Crisson for, for all, of his, all of his work. John is a, he's from Ireland. He was a monk. He is a Catholic priest. He left the cloistered life to, to, teach, at, to teach at DePaul University in Chicago and he has written scads and scads of books. He is 90 years old today, and he continues to lecture and to teach and, importantly, to study. And so it's Crisson who asks that question, the question of what was going on? What was going on that it, it, that it made that day such an incredible, incredible event? Why did Jesus happen when and where he happened? Why Jerusalem and not Detroit or, or Fall River? Why, why did it happen in Jerusalem? Why did two resistant movements, JB and JC, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, why did those resistant movements happen under the leader Herod Antipas when he had already been ruling for 25 years under complete peace. Why did this happen now? Why these goings on then and there? Well, Crisson says that to have any kind of change, you need, you need four things, four things. You need to have a tradition, you need to have an innovative vision, and then you have to have a time and a place. And so you have the tradition up here, you have the innovative vision down here, and then you have the time and the place. So what was the tradition? What was the tradition for that territory? The Jewish tradition or understanding of life was that God's rule, that God's kingdom would come by interventive eschatology. And I know that that's a bunch of big words. But basically what it meant was 
that the people are going to just wait. They're going to pray and they are going to wait for God to do something. God will bring God's rule into, into the world. This is exactly what John the Baptist believed and espoused. But then, but then John the Baptist was killed. And God did nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so in Jesus comes this other vision. This other innovative vision that intimates that maybe, just maybe, God works differently than us just waiting around for God to do something. Maybe God is waiting for us to join God. It's what he called collaborative eschatology. And so we have tradition up here, intervention, God will intervene, we don't got to do anything. And then you have Jesus down here with this innovative eschatology that says, we need to join God in this. And those two come together. But then you have a time and a place. A time, a time and a place. At that time, what was going on? It was a time of Romanization. Romanization of Jesus' homeland. So Rome's empire was expanding to the whole world, massively expanding into Jesus' home territory. And so what was happening exactly in, in that place in which Jesus, in Jesus was? What was going on in Israel? Well, commercialization of the Sea of Galilee. Rome had this global plan that they were going to take over absolutely everything. The playbook went like this. Those who have, get. Those who don't have, lose. And lose big. It is an old, old playbook, which is even in vogue today. Now, what was going on at that time? First, this, this guy, Herod Antipas, you hear that name, Herod Antipas. Herod was ruler in Judea. He was Jewish, handpicked by Rome to kind of ro rule this, this territory there. And Antipas wanted to be king of the Jews, just like his dad, who was Herod the Great, who built everything. He wanted to be that, but he was passed over. He was passed over. And so he was made a tetrarch tetrarch of this area. You have a monarch over up here, you have an ethnarch who is in charge of the people, and then you have a tetrarch which is in charge of, of the land area. Tetrarch is a dismal job, an absolutely dismal job. And he was angry that he had this low class, this low class job. So one of the things that he does in hopes of getting himself known around the place was that, and I want you to look in those papers that I have for you, the one that has the, uh, the, the maps and especially the one on the left-hand side that has the two towns of Sepphoris and Tiberias. The thing that Herod Antipas did was that he moved the capital he moved the capital from Sepphoris, Sepphoris, which was in the hill country, which was beautiful. It was absolutely gorgeous. You have nice, cooling winds, and it was a beautiful place to have the capital. Great place to have the capital. He moved the capital to Tiberias. Tiberias was on the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. So, if you are a new ruler, you don't move the capital. If I become the president of the United States, I don't say, we're going to move the capital to, you know, Gainesville, Florida. How's that going to go? It's not going to go well. It ticked off everybody. So why did he do it? And he went to, he went to Tiberias. Tiberias was, was on the lake. 
And so on the lake, you had, you had a muggy kind of atmosphere, all sorts of reeds. It was not the place to have a palace. It was not the place to have. It was, it was not a beautiful, beautiful place. And so Tiberius on the shores, try living lakeside with mosquitoes. And so no wonder Jesus had to do as much, as much healing as he had to do. Because there were so many mosquitoes that were around there giving off diseases. And so why did Antipas do it? Actually, I think he was smart. This is why he did it. I think it's interesting. Fish. fish. That's why he did it. Fish. If you go to Israel today, and, and I think a few of you have gone to Israel, one of the things you do is you go on a boat cruise and you go across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum and they always take you to go eat St. Peter's fish. St. Peter's fish. Have you had St. Peter's fish? St. Peter's fish is good. St. Peter's fish is, is delish. St. Peter's fish. You gotta have you gotta have the fish when you go on the sea. You go on the Sea of Galilee. And so Antipas moves the capital to Tiberias on the sea and builds a beautiful palace there on the sea and a huge fish complex to capitalize on the fish industry. Now is this a good thing or a bad thing? for the local small fishermen. Come on. This is a bad thing. This is a very, very bad thing. It changed the whole economy of that place. Because now all of those little fishermen have got to sell all of their fish to Rome at cut-rate prices. Again, those who have, get. Those who don't have, lose. And you lose really, really big. And so that's what was going on at that time. But somebody else moved during this time too. And so when you look on that map, just four miles from Sepphoris is another town, little town, little village. And it is called Nazareth. It's out in nowhere territory. Jesus moves his base from Nazareth to Capernaum. Capernaum is where? It's on the Sea of Galilee. So it was not only Herod Antipas that moved, it was also Jesus who moved too. Now why? Why would Jesus move his base onto that lake. Why would he do it? And the answer is traction. Traction. It was where the action was. It's where things was, this is where things were happening. And if you want to get your message of God's kingdom, of God's reign out there, you can't do it in Nazareth. Nothing's going on in Nazareth. You go down to Capernaum where things are happening. That's where the action is. That's where you can get traction. You go where the action is, where fish is. Rome's globalization. Rome's domination of force of the people. The exploitation of the little guy. Why was Martin Luther King Jr. on that bridge at that moment. You go where the action is. You go where the action is. Squeezing of the small guy. Jesus moved his base like Antipas moved his base to the sea where the action, where the action was. And so now the stage is set. The stage is set now. 
you have Roman imperial theology by force and domination. Now you say, where is theology in all of that? Well, the first thing that you do is that you pray to the gods, and then you go to war. And then you win that war, and then you gain the victory. That's it. Roman theology victory is through that way. Roman theology, imperial force versus Jesus' non-violent resistance against Rome. When you walk in here waving palm branches, you might not know, but that was a resistance movement. It's a resistance movement. It's saying that this is important. And so I'm going to be a little kid, and I'm going to wave these palms around. Resistance movements don't have to be big, huge things. They can be small things. In fact, when I leave here this afternoon, I will likely take Scott in my truck, and we will go to McDonald's to get Cokes. And I am always sure that I am wearing my tie. It's my little resistance thing that says that Sundays are important that still there is something important here on Sundays to be dressed up and available to God on, on a Sabbath day. Now that's nothing. It's stupid, right? Absolutely stupid, but it still is a resistance movement. Jesus, when he comes down, that is a resistance movement. But if you really are going to make a splash, if you're really going to do something big, I want you to take out the picture and to look on the right side of that, and you will see the temple. And you'll see the temple mount. What you do if you really want to make a splash is that you go to Jerusalem when? Passover. Passover. There is going to be tons of people there. The crowds are going to be absolutely, absolutely huge. If you are serious about the kingdom of God, the reign of God, bringing in God's world and the empire to fruition, Passover. You bring this vision of nonviolent resistance to the Jewish capital where there will be people from all over the world. All over the world are going to be right there. The people are there to remember and to celebrate. And this is the really interesting thing. What are they celebrating? What are they remembering? They're remembering Egypt. They are celebrating their freedom from Egypt, God rescuing them and getting them out of slavery, getting them out of Egypt. That's what they were, that's what they were celebrating. The Exodus. Here now in Jerusalem, they are celebrating Passover, freedom. Here's the interesting thing. They are celebrating Passover and freedom but they are under oppression and bondage of Rome. So you look at that picture, you look at the picture where, where it has um, the Mount of Olives and things like that, and it going out to Bethphage and to Bethany, but you go, the, the, the little dots will take you through the Golden Gate and bring you into the Temple Mount. And the Temple Mount is where they're going to be for the Passover. Now, all they had to do was to look up, and what do they look at? Antius, the, the, what does it say up there? What is that, that building up there? This one. The fortress. So they're celebrating their freedom, but they got soldiers walking around that fortress looking down at them just to make sure that they don't get out of line. 
Don't you think that there is something weird about that? Celebrating, celebrating freedom, but then you've got people looking down at you, ready to kill you at any, any time. So this, this was a tinderbox. Jerusalem was an absolute, was an absolute timber, timberbox. All that happened to happen, okay, all that needed to happen was one person say, you crappy Romans, and boom, a riot. An absolute riot would break out. In fact, in 4 BC, a riot did break out. 3,000 people died in the temple that day. And then a little bit later, in the common era, in 5 BC, a riot broke out. Somebody said something. And between 10 and 20,000 people died that day in the temple. In the temple. This was a tinderbox. An absolute tinderbox. And so on that day, Palm Sunday, look at the donkey and the horse. On that day, there's going to be two demonstrations. Two demonstrations. Jesus rides a donkey into the city, and he goes to the temple. He is mocking Roman force, imperial force. I mean, take a look at that picture. No man comes in riding a donkey. It's the last thing a man would do, come riding in on a donkey. Look over at the other, at the other picture, Pilate, riding Roman steeds, Roman steeds, war horses, full armor. He brought in 600 extra forces just to keep the peace in, in Jerusalem that day for Passover. Pilate, what we know about Pilate was, from Philo and Josephus, was that he was a dangerous, dangerous man. He was inflexible, corrupt, merciless, as bad an indictment as anybody could possibly get. And Pilate has given standing orders, standing orders, that if anyone should cough, execute him. If anybody in this crowd coughs, you guys would be dead. You would be dead. Standing orders. Kill them so that this place doesn't blow up. Now, civil law in Rome says that a convicted, violent resister, Rome would take the leader and the top lieutenants, and he would string them up in a row, and he would crucify all of them top leader and all of the lieutenants just so that if anybody had the idea of, of getting rough here this is what is going to this is what is going to happen now civil law for a non-violent resistor all you do is take the leader you take the leader and you crucify him you don't have to do the other ones. Save the nails. Save the nails. You just get the leader. And if another leader arises, you string up the other leader. It's all right. Save the nails. Don't, don't go out of it. So not only is Rome wanting Jesus dead, but the Jewish elders and the priests want him dead too. Better that one person die then not everybody there dies. And so Caiaphas was the high priest, and he was smart. He had been there 14 years, 14 years, and he had kept the peace between Rome and the, and the Jews. But he never, he, he noticed something about Jesus. He never stayed inside the city at night. He always was in the, in the city during the day when he had all sorts of crowds around him. The crowds protected Jesus. But he went outside of the city at night where they wouldn't go out there. So tell me, where is Jesus arrested? 
Gethsemane, outside the city. Caiaphas was smart. He knew he could get him there. He knew he could get him there. And so two tectonic plates are coming together with two mantras. First, you get peace through Roman theology of violent victory and domination. Secondly, you have Jesus in the kingdom of God where you get peace through nonviolent resistance, justice through distributive justice, fish for everybody. It's the same mantra that was in the Torah, same mantra that was in the prophets, same mantra that was in Jesus, same mantra that was in Paul. And so because of this man, Jesus Christ, he was crucified. The only one crucified because it was non-violent resistance against Rome for justice for the people. He came to bring good news to the poor, the release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free. And today, what we do, just like the donkey, we step into holy because that's what we must, must do. Let's stand and sing.
of our, of our congregation. June Rice has been moved over to the, the Jewish Health Care Center and is doing um, much, much, much better. Bev Tollock continues to go through really, really struggling. Uh, up in Lemonster Hospital, and the next day she was back at, um, at uh, St. V's. So think of, of Bev. And here's a name that we do not have to list. Linda Achardo because she is right here. After how many, many months of being on this list, we are so glad that you are here and so glad that the guy next to you is, is here too. So wonderful, wonderful, welcome back. Welcome back um, to you. So uh, we got word from Tony and Dave Wiggins that their daughter, Christine uh, Garini, um, who lives in Newton, um, went to the hospital because she could not see. Uh, and having an MRI, or, yeah, MRI done today, and she wishes that we would keep her in, in our prayers. And so we have sandwiches out there, and those sandwiches are on sale for our labyrinth. But also we have a reception, a reception for our, our new members. And so we are stepping in to Holy Week. Holy Thursday, I'll be serving communion. Friday, we have the uh, service at the Unitarian Church um, at 7 o'clock. Saturday, we have a, a, a pickup of trash all around here that's going to happen at noon. Any one of us can join us, but the, the confirmation kids are going to be doing that with me. Um, and then at 2 o'clock, we have a pet blessing. And at 2.30, new fire. What's new fire? What's new fire? New fire is that the people, the people who were going to be baptized the next morning at dawn, they would have a vigil all night and at dawn be baptized. And so we are going to be baptizing Karen Anderson at dawn on uh, Easter Sunday morning. No, we are keeping this tradition alive, and we are going to have a fire out there with s'mores and singing. We hope that you might join us for all of that. And so take a look at the song that we want to sing to one another. It's called The Benediction. We sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
good. Easter, I promise, I get you out of here at 11 o'clock. <laughs> 11 o'clock, Eastern Standard Time. The week starts. This is the big week. God loves you. Jesus Christ died for you. The Spirit gives you power and energy. Go out and step into Holy Week. Amen. Amen.